let's start with our topic, the question of transparency. Transparency in the award of government contracts remain a contentious issue, not here in Trinidad and Tobago, but throughout the world. Many officials many times have been accused of bias in the award of public funds, and unfortunately such accusations are not uncommon in Trinidad and Tobago. In the 2014-2015 Global Competitive Index, TNT, Ah, did not do very good. We marked lowest in some key areas, and those areas would uh, include favoritism, indecision of government officials. Are you ready for this? 137 out of 140 countries. Public trust in politicians, 128 of 140. <laughs> Diversion of public funds, 124. This is where we are ranking, uh, out of 140 countries. Wastefulness of public funds, 112 of 140. Not a very good picture, you would agree. Add to this, the country's Global Competitive uh, Perception Index, Trinidad and Tobago, came in 85 out of 175 countries in the most recent ranking, that is. Uh, country or territory score indicates the perceived level of public sector corruption on a scale of zero, which is highly corrupt, to 100, which is very clean. Trinidad and Tobago, unfortunately, uh, we have scored 40, uh, in the 30s in the past few years. So you see, all around, we have a problem of either real corruption, perceived corruption, and or lack checks and balances. Enter my guest. He is Rishi Maharaj. He has worked within the public sector in a senior technical capacity for over eight years and can provide an in-depth insight into the operation of the public sector. That's why we have him here. He is the holder of a BSc and an MSc in government from the University of the West Indies, and a whole lot of other good things <laughs> that we will talk about. Let me start by saying, Rishi, thank you, Rishi Maharaj. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you for having me on board, Mr. Bishop. It is really good to have you here, and it is it's very impressive to see, one, what you have done, in addition to see what is the aim of your organization. Uh, Disclosure Today is an award-winning social governance project that provides infrastructure for responsible and effective citizen engagement in public decision-making. Hmm. Such awful numbers bring us to the question, Trinidad and Tobago, is this accepted as a norm? Is this a normal or is this a disintegration of folks understanding that they must account for the trust that's given to them? I, I think that the problem we face within Trinidad and Tobago is that successive administrations, because it, it definitely can't be pinned on one particular administration, mm -hmm. S successive administrations have been uh, accused of, of illicit activities regarding the use of public funds, the way they use public funds, mm -hmm. and the way that they, they and you, you mentioned earlier about the whole idea of contract and awarding of contracts. And this also definitely relates to financing of political parties because there's a connection between financing of political parties and the awarding of contracts because mm -hmm. there is a perception within not only Trent Bigger but within most democratic countries that a lot of and you're, you're going to hear about it now a lot leading up in the build up to the, to the US election the whole idea of finances and who is financing the party mm -hmm. and once the, the problem is because elections aren't cheap elections are very expensive and most political parties don't have the necessary funds to be able to, to run such a very intricate campaign. They get financiers from, from different areas, different public sector, different mm. agencies, mm. private sector companies, people who spend money for political parties. And one of the reasons mm. why many people are perceived to spend money on political parties for campaigns, for elections, once they win elections, you now have the public purse at your disposal. To be it is called the contracts. wonderfully respected system, though unacceptable. Uh, it's called quid pro quo. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's where it operates. So it's something that we've, we've I won't, it, it's, it's hard to say, but it's something that we've become accustomed to in, in, within Trent Bago over, over recent time. And part of the whole idea of disclosure today is to try to reverse that trend and to allow government to be more open in the way it, it mm. exposes its spending mm -hmm. to, to, the, to mm -hmm. the general public. And that's one of the things that we want to do as an organization through our platform disclosure today to be able to utilize the legislations that exist, mm -hmm. one of which is the Freedom of Information Act, to try to get information from government. We are going to be dealing a whole lot with the general corruption that you mentioned because there, there, there was a reason. Corruption in itself is dynamic. It will change, it will um, mature, it will get greater or decrease, increase 
or decrease depending on the tolerance of the citizenry. The tolerance of the citizenry is incumbent on the education of the citizenry, and that's why I see an organization like yours, Disclosure Today, as such a very important body. Is 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 it that the, the, the general nature is akin to what the prime minister said uh, two weeks ago, that the, the society has to look at itself to find out if we are individually, all individually corrupt and thus um, become numb to what is generally unacceptable elsewhere? Well, it's a question I've been asking myself of late because mm -hmm. you hear political parties when they're vying for your vote. They all use the nice language. You read mm -hmm. their manifestos, they all use the proper language of mm -hmm. we're going to be transparent, we're going to be accountable, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, we're going to we're going to really free up the system and allow you all to have more of a say in how government operates for you because we are elected by you, so we are your servants. And then when they, they assume the mantle of power, it, it's almost a, a 180 degree switch to, mm -hmm. to something else. Where mm -hmm. All of a sudden, now you can't meet them on the street, you can't talk to them. There, there's that this divergence between the citizenry and the government and uh, it's it's something that i think it's scary to think it's become a new normal and mm -hmm. it's scary to think if it's something that, that we want to accept and, and I, I think i would agree with the prime minister that i think we need to have a deep introspection as a country mm -hmm. into how do we want government and governance to work for us moving forward i mean now you're seeing the whole question of the housing yes. and what the government has done with housing in mm -hmm. terms of mm -hmm. reducing the the tier of being able to apply to a lower level. Do we want big governance? Do we want small governance? And it gets to the question of interpretation. I mean, because if, if the intent of the HGC, as you mentioned it, the intention here was in fact to be low income, then one has to arrive at a number that qualifies as low income as against middle income. Now, the minister um, of, I believe, the minister responsible for housing said, for instance, if you look at what's coming out of the CSO, ha, the CSO, if you look at what's coming out there, it says that most folks are earning individually $9,000. Nine and nine is $18,000. And he says that 60% of the population, that puts you at a low income with a cap of 25000 sounding reasonable. There is the argument, however, these may be outdated numbers because today's so-called middle class of $40,000 are, in fact, in the lower income bracket. Well, and it goes to the data that you used and you mentioned mm. CSO because CSO has always been known in terms of the data that they put out may not be the wrong data, but mm. in terms of when was the data gathered to be able to put out is, is that time delay and that time delay always mm. has a problem so mm. again it's always up to interpretation but the whole aspect of what mm. disclosure theory wants to do is our aim is really to, to, to allow individuals to use the freedom of information act which many mm -hmm. people aren't aware of one right are afraid to use two because it's mm. a perceived perception that if you go to ask government for information you're nosy you want to know what's going on or why should i give you this information and three to allow to, to get the government to give us information that we want not for government to give us information they want to give us. There are a and lot of a, people who... There's a big discrepancy that you have to, to balance off there. Sorry, uh, Rishi Maharaj, my guess, I, I stepped on you. There are a lot of people who feel, those in government, um, they have heard of FOIA, but they feel as though they're doing you a favor to give you the information. You are being invasive. Make clear for all our listeners this morning, what is FOIA, the Freedom of Information Act? Right, well, let me wear my, my hat now of being a former senior officer in the Freedom of Information Unit. Good. The Freedom of Information Act was passed in, in 1999 and assented to, fully became on board in, in 2001 in, in Tobago. And one of the, the principal objectives of the act is to allow government to be able to give information to the public. The public now has a right mm. to request information from public authorities. And by, by meaning public authorities, not only ministries, but all agencies of public authority. Right. Uh, so you have National Gas Company, you have WASA, you have TN Tech, you have all those state enterprises that are set up by government. Those are now defined as public authorities under the Act. And members of the public now have the right under the Act to ask for information to public authorities of, of what, what, whatever kind of information they may want to gather in terms of spend information, awarding mm -hmm. of contracts, mm -hmm. in terms of your HR policies, your recruitment practices, and stuff like that. You have that right under the Act. Now, of course, the Act has certain exemptions, and most freedom of information legislation throughout the world have, a limit, have exemptions that are there for a purpose, because you have to protect national security interests. Yes. You have to protect certain levels of confidentiality. In, in, in bidding and stuff in like bidding that. Stuff yes. that. You mm -hmm. have to protect certain types of uh, you know, secrets mm -hmm. that organizations may want to keep that, that's special to them. Mm -hmm. You also mm -hmm. have to mm -hmm. protect government-to-government -government communication, because of, obviously there's a level of secrecy that's involved right. in that. The, the, the issue of intellectual and proprietary right. so, so issues. There are, so there are exemptions. Most, mm -hmm. most 
app wireless the Shanshu Audible has exemptions. Mm-hmm. But our, what's unique about our act is that our act, our exemptions are not absolute exemptions. They are discretionary exemptions, mm-hmm. meaning that although they may be exempt, there's a particular section of our act that, that I love. It's called section, I call, it's section 36. And section 36 deals with the public interest. And it's a lovely worded section. Mm, I, try, I, mean, I try to stay away from any section <laughs> with the 30s around it. Yeah, <laughs> well, no, it, 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 it's, it, it's a lovely worded section. Because mm-hmm. I mean, I'm, when mm-hmm. I met uh, Mr. Ramachandran Faraj a, a couple uh, a year ago, mm-hmm. he, or he was actually the AG who actually passed the legislation. I, I was I told him I was amazed by that particular section because that section, and I'm, I'm ad-libbing here, mm-hmm. but it more or less says, notwithstanding any law, Meaning, if there are certain legislations that govern public authorities that's, that exempt them from giving information, what this exemption says is notwithstanding any law, if there are certain public interest criteria that exist, for example, corruption or ex- a perceived ex- corruption, endangerment to the health and safety of individuals, etc., then the exemptions that are outlined in the Act must be set aside and the information must be given out. That is a nice way of saying that what my guest, who is a BSC and MSC in government, is saying, most of this act should really remove the exemptions. <laughs> okay, I know yeah. you didn't say that. I just played with it because if you say they, where there is a, um, a demand, a, a, a suspicion of corruption, then we have to go in a lot of right. areas. And uh, what's interesting, in, in hmm. our insurance bill in particular, many people may not know this, is that when a lot of these cases have gone to court, we have a lot of court case law now in mm-hmm. Trinidad Tobago with regards to um, people who have taken the government to court for not giving information. Our court has always been very pro giving out information. Good, good. Uh, so the court is, is very much, because our, our act also has an object. And when you look at the object of the act, the court is bound by the object of the act and they look at the public interest to be able to say yes. It's very pro. So most, almost 75, 80% of, legisla- of people who have gone to court under the FY Act, have been said, yes, the government must give out the information. This is wonderful. Um, what I am looking at is I've been to your site recently. Right. Um, by the way, I should just let our listeners know that uh, uh, the immigration issue of our guest is here, and we will be getting to him at the turn of the second half of the program. The question of the FOI is now clear. Folks understand what we're dealing with because you made it uh, very clear. There is, however, this question of how do we change the dynamics of what is. Let me, let, let, let me lay that out properly. The Transparency International report said that the Corruption Perception Index uh, of 2013 serves as a reminder that the abuse of power, secret dealing, and bribery continue to ravage societies around the world. Afro Raymond, president of the Joint Consultative uh, Commission, who was an awardee of your organization, all right, he said, when sitting politicians and our prosecuted, then everyone will know just how serious this country is about curbing corruption. My question to you is, do you believe, do you agree that the symbolic importance of holding high standards uh, lie in us arresting and taking to court a couple of people? Setting that bar, doing that symbolic, well, not really symbolic, but following the law, making the first steps so people realize it is not all, as you said before, wonderful talk on the hustings, wonderful talk on the platforms, but indeed you are going to be held accountable. Is the nation waiting, is my question, Rishi, for one act of handcuffs, go before the courts, and however that comes out, it comes out, but let's take somebody in. Is the public waiting on that, and do you think that will have an, an impact, a sort of domino effect on folks recognizing there is a price to pay for this? Let me, let, me, let me put it this way. We, we, I, I love to use this example. We love to say we need to be first world. We need to, to be first world standards. Yes. But yet when we want to, I mean, f- first world standards, for example, a perfect example is Bernie Madoff. I mean, Bernie Madoff scammed people out of billions of dollars. And where is he now? In jail, mm-hmm. somewhere locked away. Meaning that there's a price to pay. But mm-hmm. we, we, we say, yes, we want to be first world. But someone, when you reach mm-hmm. that standard of actually handcuffing someone and getting them before the court, uh, we don't reach that part. I mean, a, a good tongue on cheek play is trying to corrupt. Has anybody ever been charged for corruption? Mm-hmm. Always heard, I mean, since I've been, been small, we've mm-hmm. always heard allegations of every administration. Yep. So much of money has been, been, been stolen, so much money mm. mis- misallocated, corruption, but yet nobody has been handcuffed. And I think that's what people really want to see. Because the word on the street is they want us to obey the golden rule, but those with the goal make the rules. Exactly. You know, so I think we need to really see a, a proper enforcement of legislation, I mean, a, a, 
a, a prime good example of this is the whole question of the suspicious um, substance found in the prime minister's residence when she was prime minister. And, and you have, um, I mean, many people have been saying, well, why is that being treated separate from a normal person mm -hmm. who is held with a couple of grams of, of, of whatever in his pocket and, and taken before the court and shown before the yep. jail? Why is there a different <laughs> law? For, and and it's perception like this in big one. It's reality. People feel there's a law for one. And there's a law for the other people. I'm so glad that you refer to that because many folks think that the media, for instance, my, yours truly particularly, make a big deal about the green light substance. The green light substance is not the point. The point is if you can take this long to understand the difference between grass and gamma rays, uh, then how come you don't have that discriminating, that sort of discerning, that sort of careful investigation when it goes to certain levels of society? It is disturbing, and it sends a message. That is the important part of this. It sends a message down the line that I I if you're in the right a grouping, if you're in the right grouping, socioeconomic grouping or political or whatever, if you're in the right grouping, something can happen and you can operate with impunity uh, yeah i mean you, you can you can more or less use use your mind to to, to, to delay <laughs> justice yes and, and and be able to to walk free why normal normal person on the street will probably be in, in jail somewhere just as languishing waiting for a trial is. it is the same reason why I, I make such a big noise about the ccj because if we can stop having folks wait to get the money to go to the privy council then just as there's a possibility it will be for all and not for a few who can afford it right. it comes to the same question we're talking about even though the uh, national community uh rishi uh, maharaj is my guest here he is um the uh, director CEO. The CEO, I yep. do apologize, of Disclosure Today is an organization I went up there. I just joined up, so I'm now getting uh, my feel of it. But I, I see where folks can come to your organization and voice their complaints, but also through your organization um, make requests under the FOIA. Am I correct right. on that? So, correct. so explain that, please. So, exactly. So what our, 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 our site does, and it's www.disclosure.today. You can go up and you can, you can sign up. We, we offer a, a suite of services. Mm -hmm. So one, you can make a freedom of information request to a public authority. We have a list of all the public authorities on, on our website. And you go, you make a request, you fill out the, you fill out the form, you still look at the information you're looking to get, and you click submit, and it goes to the, the public authority. Of course, there may be some people who may not be sure exactly what they want to request, so they may, requ they may want legal advice mm -hmm. to guide them in the process. We also provide free pro bono legal advice to you to guide you along your way in terms of the way you should, you should word your request, in terms of the way you should phrase it and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. we provide free legal advice to individuals. Of course, there's also a p another issue of a lot of people don't want to make freedom of information requests in their name because there's a fear, a fear of victimization. That if somebody knows that mm -hmm. Rishi Maharaj or Oriani is, is, is making a request that, and it goes to a public authority, and then sometime later you go to that same public authority to get a service, mm -hmm. you may be blacklisted or maybe victimized. Uh, so yes. some people may be afraid, and there's a definite fear. So if there's that fear, what we allow for you to do is also to make your request anonymously. Mm -hmm. And that once you click anonymous, the request still comes to us, mm -hmm. but now disclosure today will send the request on your behalf. So nobody actually sees your name. But just to be very clear, if I go up there and I click that, uh, is this uh, is a prereq to doing this from disclosure today that I divulge, that I um, uh, make clear my business? No. Like I, no, I, no none. we okay, don't want fine, to. We fine. don't need to know. We don't need to know. Yes, what, because what the, the other question would come, who's guarding the database exactly, across yeah. there? Okay, we don't I need to it. know who hmm. you are. We don't need to know what, why you hmm. want the information. But mm -hmm. if there's a, of course, we will, we will go through. The, once it's anonymous, though, we go through the request. Mm -hmm. And we have to, of course, do our own verification to yes, ensure there's yes. a public interest that's involved. Right. And then once it's a public interest, that we feel, okay, there's a definite public interest that's involved and there's a definite need for anonymity. Mm -hmm. Then we will mm -hmm. send the request on your behalf. So it's disclosure to this and then we do requests. And not John, John Public or Jane Public. And then if a public authority also refuses your request and we feel that there's a merit in the public interest, mm -hmm. then we will also give you pro bono legal representation oh, good. to go to court. Because oh, okay. there's also that problem a lot of people feel. And, and I faced it while I was a senior officer in FY, <laughs> that many people will call us and say, well, we want to make a FY request, and the public authority has refused me. Uh, well, we're a hanker for the, uh, the act says you have the right to go to court for judicial review. Mm -hmm. but I'm a poor person. How do I afford? <laughs> I can afford a lawyer to go to court to fight my case, mm. and it, it really handcuffs a lot of people in that aspect. So what we've also done is we also going to give you, once we feel as a public interest, it's involved, it's a real serious thing that we need to get the information, something that's very important to the public. We're going to give you free representation in court 
to get the information. It is 22 minutes after 10 o'clock. Vigilance is the best guardian um, for democracy on the one hand, and an uh, empowered citizenry is in fact a body that can exercise that vigilance, and that's why I'm happy for a group like yours. Even though the national community continue to express its concern, Rishi, with the level of corruption that now exists, as can be seen from the amount of coverage we're seeing on, on the past administration, it would seem that having expressed concern about the problem as a nation, we are still not able to come up with the solutions, let alone implement them. How is your organization going to help uh, in that in, in, in that area? Well, some other projects that we're also working on, because although the school just they started off firstly dealing with freedom of information and getting inf information from the public, what we also realize is once the information is, is given, what do we do with the information? How do we, we allow individuals to, to get the information? So one different other project now we're starting to work on and starting to slowly develop is mm -hmm. the whole idea of an open contracting database. Uh, it, it goes to the whole idea of the open contracting mm. movement that, that exists worldwide. Uh, actually, what Disclosure Today did recently was we actually sent Freedom of Information requests to about 150 public authorities, state agencies, mm -hmm. to get from them their tender rules and their tender procedures, to get from them the amount of contracts that they awarded between January of of this year, I believe it was from January to August of this year, or Jan September of this year. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 name, the names of the, the individuals who... who, who they award the contracts to the cost of the contracts, uh, what type of procedure did they use to award the contract, what the true in terms of reference, was it true request for proposal, was it a sole select, what different tender and procurement procedures did you use. And uh, once we get this information from them, we're, we're now starting to design out an open contracting website to be able to allow, in the, to put this information out in the public domain mm -hmm. so individuals can now see. Because one aspect of, of transparency and accountability is one transparency, being able to get the information but also to have the information now out there in the public domain for people to be able to see it. It makes no sense if you get the information and you hold it to yourself that's right. and, and, and not put it out there to the wider sphere. Individuals need to know, so that's, that's part of the process that we're doing. Another project that we're working on is the whole idea, and you mentioned it, the whole problem of implementation. And it seems to be a, a big problem. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I worked in the, in the public service for over, over 10 years, and it's something that even before I, I, I started to work in the public sector, the whole problem of implementation, do we implement, does government fully implement? And, and what we're also now designing is a, a, a scorecard, a, a government scorecard, mm -hmm. in that we're, and we've actually gotten a good template from what someone in Canada recently did with the election of their new prime minister. They actually got a list of all the manifesto promises of that new administration. And they've now put it up on our website, and they're now going to use that now and use the FOIA and act that in Canada to be able to measure and monitor implementation. AKA so some, holding them responsible. You have to hold them yes. responsible. Mm -hmm. it's, whole, the whole, it's whole idea of, mm -hmm. of monitoring mm -hmm. to be able, and part of monitoring is, because I, I also mm -hmm. have, have, have some training in monitoring mm -hmm. and evaluation, the whole idea of monitoring is getting information, getting data, and putting data out there in, in the public sphere, in the public domain for individuals and members of the public to be able to see what's going on and then to be able to use that to ask questions. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was moved into your group and I really admire what you do and having spent 25 years uh, in the U.S. Uh, in talk radio and knowing that uh, via the FOI is where we get most of what we want and it can put us in a position to challenge and having organizations uh, who are in fact holding politicians accountable. I, I, I saw an absence of that when I, when I got back here in January this year and started looking around. And I came up on, uh, I believe would be one of your founders, Margaret Rose, yes. and what she's doing. And then I saw your organization and I, I was as happy as a, I guess, as a pig in mud <laughs> because yours and any others that we can find is, um, is what we need here. I think people feel one, there are no government resources going out to holding itself accountable. Well, that's to be expected. Why would they want to do that? However, the absence of bodies like yourself is what give them a free uh, range to run on. Preparing, what is it my mother used to say? Preparing ground for Gucci to run? <laughs> <laughs> You're listening to Brunch. It's 10.27 in the morning. Rishi Maharaj is my guest. With the government being the largest purchaser of goods and services um, in, in this country, public perception is that uh, tendering process is really the central issue because, you know, by the tendering process being uh, limited to a handful uh, of contractors, that is a problem. It encourages a number of things, conditions like fiscal indiscipline, 
discipline, uh, misuse of resources, wastage, low product quality, price fixing, overspending, and ultimately unethical business practices. All of these issues require policy and legislative solutions. Tell me how your organization is hoping to impact on that. Well, and that's the whole idea of this whole the, the whole project of, of open contracting and open on open open data open contracting. It's the, and, and I think it also goes akin to another. It, it has to go side by side with another initiative that we started, a uh, pre-election campaign, during the election campaign. One of the things we wanted to do was to get political parties to let us know who is their their financiers. And so, and and, and while, while I'm going back to this whole finances thing, okay, it goes hand in hand. It's very important. And, and you have mm -hmm. to have, have have data. So, for example, if you go in the U.S. or if you go in the U.K., for example, uh, and the, in the electoral system of the U.K., the electoral body in the U.K., they actually have a list of all the, the different people who contribute to political parties yes. in the U.K. Our, our perception in Trent Bago is that once you finance a political party, you're more favored to get the contracts. Mm -hmm. Of course, we have no mm -hmm. evidence to show who is financing the political party. So they go hand in hand, the whole idea of who is f and the whole mm. idea of political campaign finance transparency and proper procurement legislation. Because once you have an idea now of who are the party's financiers, then you can use that uh, as, a, as your backdrop to see government and in terms of awarding contracts. And once you put that contract data out in the public domain, you can now do a, a correlation mm -hmm. to see. I mean, mm -hmm. nobody expects... I mean, financiers own businesses, and these businesses will obviously bid for contracts. Mm -hmm. And obviously, they, they probably would get contracts, mm -hmm. and nobody has any problems with that. But is there a discrepancy in the percentage of contracts going to 75%, 80% to one particular financier of, of the political party as opposed to everybody else? We don't know. So that's, that's the whole idea of, of disclosure today, and whole the idea of transparency by demand. Mm -hmm. We want to do it side by side. One, let political parties tell us who is financing you, I know the, the current administration says that's one of the things they want to look at is the whole idea of campaign finance transparency. Mm -hmm. And once you have that information out there, through the proper implementation of the procurement legislation and through our implementing this whole idea of open contracting and setting up this open contracting website, we can now allow citizens to make their own decision. Mm -hmm. Go on the website to see these are the financial different political parties. These are the contracts being awarded by state enterprises. These are the tender rules. These are the procedures. These are the process that they're, that they're following. Hold them now accountable for what. Are they doing the right thing? Are they following the proper tender rules? Maybe they did a soul select. Nothing's wrong with soul select. Mm -hmm. But now so a company may come and say, well, I saw that uh, WhatsApp, as an example, did a soul <laughs> you don't, select. You don't want to use WhatsApp as an example. <laughs> let's use... <laughs> yeah, go ahead, please. Let's use I, mean, I, still, I think probably WhatsApp. <laughs> it, it, begged, it, it begged it to realizing. I'm sorry. Yeah, I know. But let's say, for example, WhatsApp does a soul select. Mm -hmm. and, you know, we now mm -hmm. have the information out there. WhatsApp does a soul select maybe 10 to $20 million yes. to a company to do wastewater services, for example. You're in business and you realize, wait, I also provide a service. Why did you do a sole select? Why did you not do an RFP or put it out to open tender so mm -hmm. to allow me to bid? Mm -hmm. So we, these questions will now begin to ask, and then you can now ask directly, ask Vasa, ask the minister, mm -hmm. and there has to be a justification now for this. There may be a justification we don't know. But now a lot of folks who have not done economics may not understand your RFP. Uh, well, uh, RFP more or less is a request for proposal. It, it's one of the processes mm -hmm. that, okay. that ministries ministries and public agencies mm -hmm. do when mm -hmm. they submit, they, they probably do either a request or proposal. This is an idea that we want to do. We have a basically idea of the terms of reference, the scope of works. We put it out there for individual companies to come back to us saying, well, this is our proposal. This is what we can do. Let's begin the talk. But there's also a, a request for quotation mm -hmm. in that the public authority may know exactly what we want to do. This is exactly mm -hmm. what we want. We respect it out. We've done our homework. This is exactly the service that we want to provide. Mm -hmm. We put it out there. Give us a quotation what you can quote us for providing the service. So there are different procurement tools that public agencies could use that many people probably aren't aware that we really want to get the information out there open. And, once you, and that's the whole idea of disclosure today. Make the information publicly mm -hmm. available so it can mm -hmm. be publicly scrutinized. I think we need to move away from the, from the mood of government issuing their reports on an annual basis or on a quarterly basis or for the ministers to stand in parliament and give questions to answers in parliament. Those are controlled situations. Mm -hmm. where the, the, I mean, I mean I, and, I, and I worked in the public sector for, for 10 years, so I, I know that, that that's how we operate. We will give the information out there to the PS, to the minister, mm -hmm. and then the information then is, is, I won't say manipulated, but is adjusted to a particular way 
to give the answer. I think that, uh, that's I think revised sure. revised would be a good but word. Uh. Revised <laughs> would be a good word. So yes. it, 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 yeah, the information is revised, and then the government puts out the information. Nothing's wrong with government putting information. That that's part of a government communication to get the information out there. But we also need to to ask the government certain types of questions that pulls out other information that they normally would not put out. And there's a particular reason why I use the word revised, because right now the United States is having a problem with com- the folks who are in charge of their Middle East policy, where a lot of uh, things that were fact were in fact passed to the higher-ups who decides to revise the report. And the Congress is having a whole discussion about that right yes. now. Rishi Maharaj is my guest this morning on Brunch from 107.7. We are talking about his organization, Disclosure Today, of which he is the CEO. A government can call upon certain doctrines such as the um, executive necessity doctrine to void a contract which is an avenue not available in a commercial contract. Now a government cannot be held liable if there is a contest between a breach of the contract and the government's public responsibilities. Question to you is what recourse is there for regaining money for a bad agreement to the best of your knowledge. An agreement gone into was bad. Disclosure today, get information. They request the FOI. They say something is fundamentally wrong with this. They bring it to the public domain. But it sits there and dies because uh, many politicians know that they can wait on nine days to pass and then nobody's paying attention. What would an organization like Disclosure Today do differently to ensure this stays in the public domain? Or what are you envisioning uh, your organization can do to push for remedy of a situation right. like I, this? I, I'm part of Disclosure Today is, is the whole, we don't see us as being the, the only drivers in this. There are other mm-hmm. Civil, there are many civil society organizations in Trinidad and Tobago mm-hmm. that, that are, are really passionate about openness, transparency, good governance. Some may be sectoral in nature, some may be more national in nature. But we at Disclosure Today believe that there needs to be a collaborative civil society movement mm-hmm. towards keeping information, to keeping issues that are really nationally burning issues within the public domain. We believe that we really need to, to engage our citizens on, on different levels. I mean, there's, there's a social media, social network, and with, with the younger citizens are more up and updated with. You have your Facebook, you have your LinkedIn, you have your Twitter, you have all these different nice areas. But also we need to get down to the, to the other individuals who may not use social media to get them to understand the need, and that's where you need to, to engage with other grassroots organizations, other civil society organizations. We don't see disclosure today. We don't see ourselves... As, as the one all and done all for yeah. transparency and openness, mm-hmm. we totally believe in collaboration. In fact, when we did our political financial transparency initiative for the 2015 elections, we actually got support from several NGOs, for example, Democracy Watch and the Constitutional Reform Forum. Mm-hmm. And we actually also signed up to the Council for Ethical and Responsible Behavior. We were actually one, one, of the NG- one of the few NGOs that have signed up to, to that cooler of conduct. Because we believe in a collaborative approach and we believe in working with other civil society organizations that may have an issue, that may have an uh, interest to really keep this in the, in, the, in the front burner. I see all these things that we have identified. There is going to be the question of uh, uh, integrity in these bodies because at the end of the day, you can have an integrity commission who if the integrity is questioned, then who's paying attention anyway? Uh, the Procurement Act is the area where I want to go on that. It provides for a public procurement commission to treat with the irregularities and complaints of non-compliance. Um, and, and, and we understand that the president has said, and if we don't understand, the president said, I will get me a director of this. Um, and that, I guess, will deal with a lot of issues. For instance, um, well, I'll get to that part in a minute. A, a whole lot of, of contracts that are in. How confident are you and your organization, by natural extension, in the legislation that deals with public procurement and this proposed public procurement commission, how confident are you that this is consistent with what your body is hoping uh, will happen in the area of accountability? Well, I, I, th- I think to, to start from, from this role, founder Margaret Rose has been very active in the whole idea of procurement reform and procurement legislation. And, and one of her other organizations that she heads mm the Caribbean Procurement Institute, mm-hmm. she actually played an active role many years back in trying to revise the, the former procurement legislation in terms of drafting mm-hmm. new policies and, as, and working with government on governance issues to be able to, to draft the whole idea of a new procurement 
legislation which we ha- now have. Mm-hmm. So I believe it's important to have proper procurement legislation, but the fact of the matter is regardless of whatever legislation mm-hmm. you have or whatever legislation you pass, whatever commissions, whatever bodies you pass or whatever commissions you have, it's only as, as effective as how we the citizens, I believe, really want them to be. Yes. I mean, the procurement regulator is, is also going to be a public authority under the Act. So it's also going to be subject to freedom mm-hmm. of request. Mm-hmm. So I think we need in Trent to be able to, to really change our mindset from just, I mean, you can pass <coughs> um, uh, how many laws you want to pass. And many people have, have said this in the past. Laws don't make change. That's right. Uh, laws create systems. They create processes. They create yeah. rules. But it's, it's up to, to us as citizens to be able to, 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 to use these laws to be able to force governments and to force administrations and to force agencies to be more accountable and we need to be the ones in the end that i got i think we need to to, to stop using the, this backseat approach of well the law has been passed we have this regulator in place now everything is going to be hunky dory and everything is going to be fine but unless we really be vigilant then it's 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 probably it may start off well but then it may that after a while just plateau and just and, and then we have the same arguments five, six years from now. The voice you're hearing on brunch this morning, one oh seven point seven, is that of Rishi Maharaj. He's the CEO of Disclosure Today, one of by his own admission, many organizations who are looking for good governance. We are exploring with with him a number of areas that would have to be uh, dealt with, and we are hoping one of them is my pet peeve. In a case, and we're talking about uh, from the Freedom of Information Act, I remember when the issue of the Shagaramas Development Authority. Uh, came up and the awarding of this land for the hotel and so on. We were told it, it happened there and then it happened in an instance with SIS. We were told these are private discussions that we don't have to make public. Now I'm a little confused here so please educate uh, please educate me on this. If these are the public this is public land you're talking about. This is a contract between the people who are represented by their government mm-hmm. and someone else. To tell me that the agreement, uh, the, the agreement, the conditions of it, the terms is private is insulting me. One is two. I must, I really believe is a misrepresentation of, of of law. Tell me, am I incorrect on that? And and you can continue by finishing and telling me in cases like that, should you agree with me? What can disclosure today do for us to, 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 to make sure these people are brought to heal? I use that deliberately. That's how you call uh, behavior. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, the whole aspect of, of the, 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 the land down at, um, at Mufitong, for example, and again, I think the Minister of Planning at the time stated that those were discussions uh, that they were having with the, the then proposed developers to be able to, to develop the land. Uh, the JCC at the time had, had an issue with that, Afro had mm-hmm. an issue with that, and eventually mm-hmm. took them, he, f- he made a freedom of information request, and eventually it, it did go to court, and interesting judgment in that, in that the Ministry of Planning relied on lawyer-client privilege, mm-hmm. in terms of they, they got legal, they got, that, they got some legal advice, whatever, like that, in terms of discussions and whatever, and JCC wanted to know well, what advice did you get in, in leading up to these discussions. Mm-hmm. Filed for a request. Yeah, for a request. Obviously, was was denied, and, and he went to court. And the court, in in, in interesting way, where many people have thought that a, a, a client, lawyer, legal professional privileges would have been protected by the court. In this instance, the court ruled in favor of GCC and said mm. that the information must, you must 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 give the information. So again, it, it relies heavily on the public interest. Now I can't sit here and tell you what is the public interest because the public interest is a very fluid. Yes, it's a very mm-hmm. fluid concept. In mm-hmm. fact, th- there's a case of uh, Sanka versus the Public Service Commission where the court in the, in that case trying to give a justification for the public interest more or less stated. It's difficult to give a definition or or test as to say what is the public interest and what is not. But you must define what is in the public interest as opposed to what is interesting to the public. So there must be a, a demarcation in that. Understood, but it's glaringly obvious. And, and, and I got your Invasion Bay uh, situation you brought into, into the picture. I was dealing in the case of, of the Shackleman's Development Authority giving uh, land for the development right. of this hotel. In the case of SIS occupying state land that they intend uh, to deal with making legal, but for now they are using it. Those are not things that no, should those are, be... No, those are things that are not confidential and should not mm-hmm, be confidential. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the day, what, 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 mm-hmm. once, 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 once it involves public money, once it involves public property, yes. because most of these lands are public property, yes, I, I, they are owned by the state, but they are they're vested to the state in our public interest. So the state mm-hmm. has to work 
or has to operate within our public interest in terms of dealing with this information. Now, now if, if in the end it's in the public interest to, to develop these properties, that be it. But the public should be at least aware of, and these kind of things must be open. Of course, they may rely on confidentiality clauses, which is probably what they're probably going to rely on. But but in the end of the day, what the Freedom of Information Act says is that you have the right to be able to request this information. Mm -hmm. If at the end of the day, the public authority or the government decides that based on our advice, we think that the discussions are confidential, it's, it's, a, it's a very sensitive nature, and we're not going to give the information, mm -hmm. then at the end of the day, what disclosure today can do and will do once there's a definite public interest issue involved, is that we will go to court and we mm -hmm. will we will work with public any public or any citizen, any private sector organization, any civil society mm -hmm. organization to go to court. So then in the end of the day, the court must be your your final arbiter. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. and it's it's something that I always <laughs> it's funny because I always had this discussion. That I am not a lawyer by training, but I always had discussions many times with, with lawyers in, in public sector agencies. When they said, well, we're going to exempt based on legal advice. And my advice, my response to them was, well, yeah, that's your legal advice. <laughs> but at the end of the day, the court mm -hmm. should be the mm -hmm. final determining factor. Mm -hmm. And our court has always been very pro freedom of information, very pro once the public interest is involved. And that's something that disclosure today can and will do. We will actually go to court for you on your behalf or with you to be able to let the court make a final decision on this. Is it the public interest to give it out? Um, I mean, once the court rules in, in your favor, then the Then so be, be it. It's 15 minutes away from the top of the hour, 11 o'clock. Rishi Maharaj, uh, CEO of Disclosure Today, is my guest, reminding you that we will, at the top of the hour, switch gears into the area of immigration, the question of free movement of people uh, uh, throughout the Caribbean. We will also be dealing with that issue of um, the CSME, which is free movement in the Caribbean, and all the things that are involved in that. That will temper people in um, being intolerant when they hear visas are overstayed and when they hear that some Somebody misunderstood what, in fact, the law said. But that for later, this for now. We are talking right now about disclosure. There is the question of bad actors, which is part of what are your uh, bad actors. I mean, contractors who get um, a, a tender. Yes, we'll be monitoring. Let us say, for instance, the first phase is that they play by the rules. The bidding process was accurate. Ha. Let us just say it is done. Bidding process is done by the books. Now we have to look at when you say by the books, are you taking into consideration someone who received, i.e., five contracts from government altogether, and on three of them, the performance was subpar? Does the, is that not um, something that must be put into the mix when you decide? Can you decide on saying that someone comes in with the lowest bid, but they have no history and there is no way to prove that, in fact, they have done this before? I mean, how is disclosure today going to assist us in that? The Freedom of Information Act, you can go ahead and you can request information on the contract, but the history of these companies, uh, what is disclosure today going to do in, in that area, giving me that sort of information, me, the citizen? Well, well, uh, well the problem with that, that piece, of course, is that most well, all these organizations, all these companies would be private sector organizations. So the Freedom of Information Act does, does not, unfortunately, touch, mm -hmm. touch mm -hmm. private sector organization, of course. Mm -hmm. It's something that we may need to consider to, to revise the Freedom of Information Act. And that is precisely why I raised it, because I think when you say, for instance, uh, we are, we're having public disclosure, if I am the receiver of the tender, then you must give me the history of the company. I will do my best to protect your intellectual and proprietary rights, however... Context is always important. Mm -hmm. It's not just good enough for Rishi to come and say, hey, Renny, I got a deal for you. You know, take this. And I say, Rishi, I like the sound of that. Let's go with it. I got to know if Rishi is a scamp or not, or if Renny is a scamp yeah. or not. And and, 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 and and that is one of the areas we may have to look at. Yeah, no, we, and we have we got a lot of countries, for example. I gave you two examples. One is Mexico, one is South Africa. Uh, yeah. Where they've actually, the, the, the access to information legislation mm -hmm. is as such that it actually touches on private sector organizations mm -hmm. does, that performs functions on or behalf of the state mm -hmm. uh, for the benefit of the state. So what it actually does, and, and it, it's, of course, it relates solely to that particular agency, so for that particular interaction. So, for example, if an organization has been awarded a contract to pave a road, well, of course, it's a private sector organization, you can only make an FOI request regarding that organization with regards to what... In, with regards to that state mm -hmm. interaction. Not mm -hmm. not if it's doing some other private sector work with some other agency. That's not beside the point. So that's what some freedom of information legislation have, has done. 
and, and two examples I saw was, was Mexico and South Africa, where they've actually expanded the legislation mm -hmm. to touch on state, on private sector mm -hmm. enterprises that does work on or behalf of the state. So it's maybe something that we need to do because in terms of revising our Freedom of Information Act. But again, other things that we can do right now and for now is, uh, is part of the whole idea of citizens need to be more vigilant yes. with regards to how their public monies are spent. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so um, what we are going to be doing as part of this closure today, uh, like I mentioned, is your whole idea of open contracting and having the information out there. So now we know who has been given the contract and for what they've been given the contract for. Uh, some, some ideas we actually play in our minds with right now is the whole idea of allowing citizens now to be able to, to, um, to develop a website on this. Of course, it's just playing in our minds right now to allow to probably develop a website for citizens to be able to monitor how these contracts are not being implemented. If somebody, mm -hmm. for example, has a road paving contract, how is maybe take pictures on your smartphone or whatever and upload it to see exactly the work that's being done. Thank you. And if mm -hmm. you work probably five years, five, a week or a month afterwards paving the road, mm -hmm. you realize the road is now starting to collapse. Again, you snap a picture, you put it up there. It's a way of monitoring. It's it is very clear that this man a, is familiar a, with what happens on the street <laughs> because this whole question of road paving it's is a, a whole revolution yeah, by it, itself. It's a way of it's a way of monitoring. Mm. It's a way of evaluating mm -hmm. of, of what's going on. So, for example, if we have this out there now, again, it's all about putting information out there, and that's the way the world is moving now. The world is moving to the whole idea of open data, open open government, mm. open governance, open contracting, having information out there, yes. and allowing mm. citizens also to be part of the process of monitoring what's going on. Rishi, I'm going to have to do a kind of rapid fire on you. Yeah. We've got ourselves like about 10 minutes here before we get to immigration, but there are a couple of questions I, I do want to throw at you. The whole question of disclosure today, folks, this is a watchdog group. We You have to get involved in this group and other alike organizations because that is the way we understand how our money is being spent. I'm always reluctant when folks say the public money. We we are the public, <laughs> how our money is being spent. There's a question of reconciliation, income to living standard rec reconciliation. Uh, I know that's an issue for the revenue authority when they come on stream, but disclosure today, watching and understanding what's going on. Is that going to be a part that the organization will be looking at, i.e., you cannot make yourself $150,000, $200,000 a year and be living in a $20 million house. I mean, you know, there's something very wrong with that, and you're taking 20 trips per year, and, and, and you have the latest of everything. There is something wrong. Or even if you're still living modestly, but your family uh, suddenly, um, who have not changed their employee, but they're living really large. Or your family members are all members of some um, group of companies. I mean, is that something Disclosure today would be looking at? I'm not sure if something the Disclosure today would be looking at, but, but what, like I said, one of the main things we're focused on is the whole idea of transparency on demand. Mm -hmm. The whole idea of being able to, to one, force government to be mm -hmm. able to like, put inf more information out in the public domain get the information, have it out there, but also to engage citizens and civil society. And, and I, guess, I guess this whole goes to the whole question of citizens and civil society engagement for mm -hmm. them to be, because, I mean, we are just a small organization, um, five or six people within the organization as we now start to build up and, and develop ourselves. But we can't watch everything, we can't see everything. Understood. And it's, it's really reliant on trained audience and Tobagonians to be more vigilant in the way their money is being spent, in the way people who have assumed power What's going on with their lives and to be again, but it's not also it's it's also not about Macquin people business. No, but no. being vigilant. But well, it's one of the reasons I things. pursued you that hard. I pursued you that hard because your organization is one that I hope will keep growing uh, to the extent where you can have an investigative body to do some of your own work. Because again, that's what watchdog groups do. Kurt Wait, um, a fix in TNT, made a suggestion a while ago that I want to uh, throw at you. He suggested that state boards, those who are appointed to state boards, their bio should be made public on a government website where folks can go up and look at it. My question is, is that productive or counterproductive in the sense that will it keep people away from offering themselves for that kind of service, or do you think that is a good suggestion? It, it depends. Uh, I'll, I'll put it to you this way. Many people have, have said that the Integrity Commission coming on board and the stringency of the information you have to give to the Integrity Commission is as such that many people have, have shied away. Many good people have shied away from offering out themselves for, for state board appointments because of that, mm -hmm. because of the fear. So there's that fear that, that you also have to play with. Many people are, are, are afraid of, of having all that kind of information out there. And you have, mm -hmm. you, but you also have to balance, and this is another thing that maybe we can discuss some other time, that I also, also have a very personal interest in, the whole idea of personal privacy protection and mm -hmm. data protection. 
what if after you pass I'm trying to be good many people may not be aware so may uh, say as very quickly as you as you wind up no 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 don't 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 rush that one we can wait go ahead make clear on that because no, that's really yeah, important we've actually passed something called the data protection act mm-hmm. and i was actually part of the team in government at the time when we passed the data protection legislation and part of the whole idea of data protection legislation is to be able to and, and it's, it's the flip side of, of being able to access information being able to protect people's private information and sensitive personal information. Mm-hmm. And what that act actually does is that act actually, once fully implemented, develops an information commissioner's office. We've actually modeled it after the UK's model, where the information commissioner will be responsible for data protection and freedom of information. And in that you all, you have to balance giving out information, but also balance protecting people's personal information and private personal mm-hmm. information. So is that, so while I understand what Mr. Wade is saying, with regards to putting everything out there in the information, there is a balance that has to be, you have to tread very lightly. Well, on. the public interest is, and I agree with that, the public interest is another area that we have to um, uh, always um, go after. And I know that is what your organization is there to protect the public interest. Because in the case of WASA, saying that uh, the way the quarrying licenses have been given out, I mean, folks willy-nilly, well, not willy-nilly, but against the best interest right. of the citizenry, which is to say WASA is collecting water for everybody, the way the quarries are done. I mean, if, 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 if you look at that kind of arrangement, you want to know how these quarrying licenses were given if not, what is the criteria? That's the sort of thing you want to know. When you go to Toko and you find that the beaches now you have more gravel than you have sand, this is a consequence of people quarrying willy-nilly. You say, well, who was given this license? What is holding them um, at some checkpoint? Is that something your organization will be asking for? Oh, yeah, that, that, that's definitely information that, uh, that mm-hmm. one needs, needs to find out from an environmental point of view. It has mm-hmm. impact on the environment. It has impact on flooding. It has impact on, on, on many different aspects of vegetation, natural wildlife, everything. So all these things that, what we say in our disclosure today is that once members of the public hears about anything or has an idea of something that, that's going on or a contract has been awarded or any different thing that there may seem to be uh, an idea of concern or an idea of query, mm-hmm. go to our website, www.disclosure today, sign up, join us, and communicate with us to be able to send a freedom of information request to a particular public authority so we can begin the process of being getting the information and one yes again something probably i forgot to mention once the information has been given out and the public authority has accentuated the given out the information mm-hmm. part of what we're going to do on the platform is that we're actually going to put the information out there open up in the public domain so everybody sees the information so it's not just kept in secret but it's out there for everybody to see I do my synopsis at this point um, uh, Rishi Maharaj the CEO of Disclosure today in addition to thanking you for being here being candid and shining a, ho- a light on this situation and giving me yet another muscle of encouragement that something can be done with this because they, they, it, it has to start from watchdog groups our listeners are to go in order they can go to your site you, um, as I did I went in there and I signed up it's absolutely free uh, put in your email email address, put your contact information, and through your organization, I can make requests. Yes, you can. Uh, is there a petition, for instance, would your organization be putting petitions for folks to um, sign on to, or would you be functioning if someone moved a petition to your organization, you will leave that up there where folks can either participate? Yeah, what, what we actually have is something called, it's actually called Disclose Propose. Um, the part of the propose function, if people have an idea of, uh, idea of a solution to mm. a problem that they mm-hmm. want, they can actually propose a solution and then they can use through the website, through social media, to gather other supporters mm-hmm. of their solution, and we will then pass it on to the, the email addresses of all the ministers mm-hmm. and senators in parliament, and then be able to use that and through your lobbying with your different social media groups to try to get something done. There is a whole lot of discussion surrounding the police before you go, so the way in which uh, police commissioner is um, is in fact appointed. I know that the Prime Minister has said that they are going, well, if not the Prime Minister, maybe it was the Minister of National Security. They are going to move early with dispatch to see that that is corrected. That is another thing that we have heard. This is not challenging anything that has been re- recently said, but we have heard, as you um, articulated way earlier, a lot of things being said, and after nine days, it drops. It's for a long time this question of the police commissioner uh, and how he's appointed and who holds the power to this has been going around. Such an instance is one that your organization will be char- challenging in the context of correcting uh, whatever legislation is necessary to ensure that these things move forward. Yeah, and what we're doing right now, we're actually going through the, well, it's, it was the manifesto, the PNM, it's now the official policy government document, the, the manifesto, mm. and we're actually going through it now and pulling out 
about all the, the, the promises, all the things, actions that the government has proposed mm. to do in during their term in office. We're going to mm. put it up on our website and then begin to use that as a basis for citizens to be able to monitor what's going on. Part of it will be legislation, for example, dealing with crime, dealing with the appointment of the commissioner of police, amendment to the procurement legislation, uh, campaign finance reform legislation, amendments, diversification of the economy, which we've been talking about for generations and mm -hmm. generations about. I'm going to have all these up there and use it now for, for us as, as disclosure today, for other civil society organizations and for citizens to be able to monitor what's going to see. What's, are, you, are you really doing what you promised to do when we elected you? I conclude by asking you, by revisiting something I asked you. I did get the answer. I just would like it repeated. Do you concur with Mr. Afro Raymond that the public is waiting for somebody to be slapped with beautiful bracelets and taken into account as something that will cause the nation to start thinking about consequences to their actions? Do, I mean, is this something that sits at the, t at the desk at the front step of the current administration to have something done here because if you are going to question people, if you're going to ask people to question their morality, say, you know, uh, they, um, you know, when they call this one, this, this one is a thief and this one is a thief, stealing work hours is stealing. If you're going to ask people to, 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 to tweak the way they think in the, in the context of corruption, they have to see an example coming from you that you are holding those who most people believe have committed glaring acts and they're waiting for you to do something. Do you concur with that? I, I, I think that the people need to see tangible mm -hmm. evidence mm -hmm. that something is being done. And the one major tangible evidence that people will believe that's being done mm -hmm. is when people are actually taken to court and hold before the court to be held accountable for the action that they've taken. He's been very kind, one of the few people to follow me through that whole long-winded thing I just did. <laughs> <laughs> and follow me and stay on course. Uh, Rishi Maharaj, thank you so much for thank taking the time to be with us. Uh, and do not be a stranger. I will be contacting you again because this is an issue that all uh, of Trinidad and Tobago and the world, as a matter of fact, they are looking at. And I say the world because folks always have to keep in mind that index is being seen around the world. That perception of us is something that investors are looking at. If you're talking diversification, you're talking about any kind of um, long, sustainable ideas or economy, you're talking about confidence in your governance. And that's why your organization is so important. Have you said for a wonderful day. Thank, Thank you. you.